Hello everybody, how are you going? Welcome to Canada vs the USA, a video about my thoughts on living in the USA as a Canadian. Now of course, there's a bundle of people that are going to be doing such a things, just jumping over, experiencing both cultures, but how does that actually impact what your perception is? How's it going guys? Uh, the topic for today's video is United States versus Canada. So I was born in Canada. I lived in Canada for the first 25 years of my life. Okay. I traveled around uh, the world for a few years, came back to Canada. Now I've been living in the United States here for about 145 days or so at this point. So okay. what are my thoughts? What are the differences? <laughs> Is there like a really big difference when you cross that imaginary line and you come into the United States? What's the difference, D-Man? tell us. So like growing up in Canada, we get this type of perception and we get these ideas about, you know, what Americans are like. They're very greedy, they're big and obese, and they just wow. love football and war. That's what Americans are about. You know, wow, that's coming straight out of the gate and really just playing fully into it. some very niche stereotypes. There are, of course, going to be others, but yeah, when you just go, okay, the USA has, what is it, 40% of the world's expenditure on war in one year, with it being like 900 billion or whatever it is, it's a lot. And so you can go, okay, I guess, well, maybe they do like war to some degree. And then if they're just greedy, I mean, I guess that's just going to be because they have, what, the most billionaires in the world? Is that where that mindset's coming from? Of course, he also mentioned being addicted to football to a degree, and I think that one's actually not the worst thing. Maybe it encourages some poor behaviors, but at the same time, being addicted to a sport and at least just trying to get people out there playing it and enjoying it isn't going to be the worst thing, for goodness sake, Canada and its ice hockey and all its other sports. They definitely go hand in hand. Every country basically is addicted to at least one sport. So like I said, I would love to know where in Canada he actually grew up and then also where he went to. Is he doesn't look that old, but he spent 25 years in Canada, then traveled around, then spent, and it threw me off as saying 145 days. It's half a year. You'll be right saying half a year. It's not that far off and you're only a month off being there for half a year but then also where is that half a year is that could be a huge difference especially in the US I feel like compared to most countries it feels like in the world the US has the biggest range within its own country you know just uh, since I've been living down here I wouldn't say that I've noticed like a profound difference in how you know people are including like the size of people like you think when you come to the America you're gonna people. see Every, that everyone's just gonna be overweight. But if you go to Canada, there's a lot of overweight people there as well. So for me, I haven't really noticed any difference in terms of the size of people. Do people seem like really like greedy here in America? It's all about the money. It's, it's all about the money essentially wherever you go in the world for most people. So I wouldn't say that it's like any, any more different than Canada. You're gonna have greedy people wherever you go in the world. Yep, there are absolutely greedy people all over the world. And even the fact that he said, oh, I didn't notice a huge difference in size of people. I mean, really every metric basically says that Canada and the US are very, very on par. You might have this idea and maybe once upon a time, it would have been a little bit more different before some brands and ideologies kind of moved up to Canada as well. But realistically, all of the Western countries are basically just all on par with one another. The obesity rates, the hospitality rates, the mortality rates. It's a very, very similar thing. Even down to the fact that, of course, worldwide humans can be greedy and exploitive. And so it's not just a USA concentrated thing. They may have the most people out of all the Western countries and the biggest GDP and the highest amount of billionaires, but that's just because all of those numbers kind of go together. And isn't America all about war and war and war and war, more war? Obviously war is a big, um, war in the army and all that kind of stuff is definitely a big thing here in the United States. I would definitely have to agree with that. I've ridden past this big Air Force base here in Tucson and driven past it. And I'm just like, okay. holy moly, they have a lot of planes here. They probably have more planes at that one Air Force base than the entire Canadian army has. Probably, and is it a bad thing? Maybe, is it not a bad thing? Also probably true. I mean, of course the argument always is if that massive military budget did truly go to other places, it would be an interesting case study to see how quickly the USA would be affected if it went into healthcare expenditure or education or environmental protection or whatever it may be, even just a slice of it, even what, like NASA's budget used to be huge and now it's nothing. In all of those different factors, how could you allocate that? And that's where, 
whether it's good or bad, they do have a lot of money at their disposal. So it's not surprising that, like I said, when you have 40% of the world's military expenditure in one year, and China probably has a decent chunk of that as well, that all the other countries are kind of just fodder in terms of the amount of planes that they can truly get, especially because the USA makes their own planes from Lockheed Martin to Boeing and everyone else in between, all the drones. It's just crazy. And I just wanted to look at what he was talking about because at least we now do know exactly where he was located, as he said, Tucson in Arizona. And when I first searched it up, I went, oh, okay, it must be here. But then looking at the little label that I took off, it was International Airport. And then I went, oh, that means that, oh, the bigger one almost, or at least the one with more land around it, is the Air Force Base, which is crazy as well. But then, of course, when you zoom in, you can see that they're uh, the plane color changes a little bit. It goes from more white to more gray. I don't know what all of these crates are. I guess, oh, they're not crates. Oh, they look weirdly 3D, but they're not. They're just shelters for all their planes as well. And so I guess this is what he's talking about. And look, I have no idea how many planes would possibly be here, especially in contrast to how many the Canada would have. But really, all of these bases... Hang on. Oh, is this where the graveyard is? Oh, wow. That's really what he's talking about then. That makes so much more sense. They have so many planes. They have, is this, yeah, this must be the, unless it's not, that would be even more crazy. If this isn't the US Army's graveyard for all their planes, but then there's a Blue Angels there. Huh? Surely they wouldn't decommission the Blue Angels, at least not without repainting it or something. I have no idea. That is nuts. Oh, even just this Pine Gap looking stuff, but all of these aircraft, my goodness, that'd be a pretty cool sight to see just to be able to ride your bike past it. Either way. I can certainly see what he's talking about, but honestly, probably just the Air Force Base has more than Canada to a degree. All in all, you know what? I haven't noticed any like, um, just dramatic changes. Obviously, when you live in Canada, everyone is entitled to universal healthcare. How it worked oh, yeah. when I was living in British Columbia, um, if you made a certain amount of money every single year, then you had to pay a certain premium. It yep. wasn't like that much. I think it might have only been like fifty to hundred dollars per month. I think it depended on how many okay. people are in your household. I'm not. Ex I can't remember exactly. Wow. But if you didn't make enough money, you didn't have to pay that healthcare premium, <laughs> which it seems to be kind of the opposite here in the United States. If you can't afford healthcare, then you're fined one hundred and fifty dollars every single month on your taxes, which seems a little kind of like crazy to me because if you can't afford healthcare, then why are you charging somebody one hundred and fifty dollars per month in order? to live without healthcare. How have I not heard of that before? Or I at least certainly don't remember that. $150 a month directly taken out of your income via tax for not having, what, private health insurance? Or I guess any health insurance because all health insurance is going to be private in the USA. That's crazy. I mean, like I said, the way in which it would work in Canada would be very, very similar to Australia. And so if you do earn over a certain amount, I think in Australia, it moves, but it's about a hundred grand, let's say. If you do earn over that amount, you start paying an extra levy, which is meant to incentivize people to at least put that money that they would be giving to the government into private health insurance to try and take some of the load off the public health system. At least that's the idea behind it. It doesn't work for everyone, and of course, some people can't afford either, but it's still a whole minefield, of course, but at least it doesn't sound like those in worse situations have to pay even more money because i guess in the usa then everyone's paying money either to the government or to a private health insurance company i'm not exactly sure about you know what's going on with that but one of the main cultural differences is that canada does try to provide health care for everybody whereas it's privately uh it's privately run in the united states and i would say that's probably one of the major differences going from the united uh going from canada to the United States. Yeah. And for me, since I don't have health insurance right now, but it's something that we're gonna look into just because uh, if it only costs us, you know, I don't, I don't even know how much it would cost, but if it doesn't cost us that much, then it's nice to have for like emergencies. Oh, absolutely. And that would be a big, big deal, especially just, I, it boggles my mind how some people just get into lifelong debt. Like how do you ever buy a house, let's say, if that's your goal, how do you ever buy a house in the USA if you broke your arm when you were 15 or maybe 19, let's say, because then your parents aren't more obligated to pay for you. And so if you broke your arm when you're 19 or 20 and you have $180,000 in debt, how is it possible? How, how do you ever recover from that? Do people just keep taking out more debt to cover their previous debt? It sounds like an awful, awful spiral. And I guess that's kind of the reality of it. But man, is it just brutal. And so to be going from a universal healthcare type situation in Canada down to there, it is going to be a bit of a shock to the system, but at least you are coming in more as a tourist, so to say, even if you are staying long term. However, I never really understand how that works in terms of if the USA goes to Canada or to Australia, 
how does that work? Do we pay for them? Do they get subsidized? Is it full price? I've never really looked into that. Like I know that I have to be more kind of like careful with stuff, right? Yeah. So I'm not gonna go out and buy like a mountain bike and start shredding up all the trails because it's very easy on a mountain bike to like fall over, break an arm, break a leg, whatever. Break, your break spine. a collarbone. So Ugh. like for certain for certain activities, I'm a little bit more kind of like wary and a little bit more cautious. Yeah. When I'm riding my bike on the road, I'm not doing really dangerous, stupid stuff. I'm just trying to ride more more <laughs> I'm just trying to ride more along with the lines of the rules of the road, which you should be doing anyways, but I'm just more kind of like conscious and aware that I wow. don't want to injure myself yeah. because I'm going to be paying for it out of pocket if it's serious enough. Oh man, that's so interesting in terms of it almost limits to creativity and sporting endeavors and everything like that. Like you're really going to be having... I guess well-off parents, if you're growing up and you want to be a an Olympic mountain biker or downhill skier or anything like that, you are going to be of a certain wealth class to be able to afford the private health insurance that at least puts your mind at ease that as you are bound to break something eventually almost, especially if you're just learning and so you need that cover. But if you don't have it, then it just completely limits what, let's say half the population from ever even thinking that they would want to attempt it because if they just attempt one stunt, that's it. They're not even just their careers over, their, their entire life could be over. And so, wow, it's just, I've never thought about how creatively limiting that truly is, let alone just financially limiting and people trying to really get the best job and hating their job, but just staying for the benefits that they get. Oh, it's, it, oh, there's so many possible things that could change there. But man, just even like you said, even as a Canadian, you're really going, oh, I do just have to make sure here. Also, America is known as like one of the biggest capitalist societies in the world. And I would have to agree with that. Like if you want anything, right? Anything that you can think of, it is like available in the United States. Right. Coming from Canada, we don't have, like there's Amazon Canada. Amazon.com in the United States is like a whole different animal. And if you're signed up for the, for Amazon Prime, like you can get, so many different things shipped for free, two day shipping uh, to your front door at what a pretty good price. And that's yeah. just something that is not available in Canada. Yeah. There, there just isn't obviously the same demand. I don't know, it's just like Canada is not, like it is into capitalism, like it is a big capitalist country, but not as much as the United States. Of course, and I do quickly now wanna see it came out, okay, eight, years ago. Wow, that's way longer ago than I would have thought. But Australia at the same time was in a very, very similar situation. I kept hearing people going, yeah, one day shipping, two day shipping, you can just get anything on Amazon. Meanwhile, Amazon was still just a bookstore with maybe some random stuff, but realistically it was just a bookstore eight years ago. And only over the last, oh, let's say four or five years, it really has just become a very, very different beast. They completely expanded their range. You can now get Prime and all the shipping and you can get Basically, I guess anything that you could realistically get in the USA seems to be generally available in Australia. And I would love to know how all their modeling works in terms of the scalability of a model like that really is dependent on just having so many consumers like in the US, just having three, 400 million people almost now compared to 30 or 40 million in Australia and Canada. And so that makes a big, big difference in terms of how scalable it is, just buying by the shipping container, whatever it may be, even just the amount of customers you can get, at least they don't have to be worrying about serving as they have AWS as they can just cover all that themselves but oh it's so intricate but the US was just years ahead of everyone else they just had so many options a a anything you could possibly get while everyone else was just sitting reading books still on Amazon so those are the main differences that I've noticed um, from living in Canada my entire life as a Canuck and then moving down here to the United States uh, for close to almost uh, five months now would I say that like one is better than the other now, I mean, like, they both have their pros and cons. There's yeah, pros to living in the United States, and there's definitely pros to living in Canada. But, and there's also cons to living um, in both of those places as well. Yeah. All in all, everyone that I've encountered so far has, you know, been friendly and helpful and... Uh, for me, it's been a good experience thus far. And look, that was eight years ago, and of course, some things have changed for the better, some things have changed for the worse over the last eight years. That just is the reality of it, and so it'd be interesting to see if he did live there for longer or pop in and out. How has that changed over this last decade? But at the same time, some countries in their main routes don't really change. You know, it's not like Amazon's just disappeared and now it mainly is in Canada or anything like that. And look, I've said it a million times over, but it is a good thing that for all of their similarities, these two countries 
countries do have their differences, whether it's culture, whether it's people, whether it's food, whether it's economics or anything like that, you do offer two different situations and cultural perspectives so people can gain perspective on their own country or another, or even just go to the extent of moving and committing and just going to the place they really want to be, whether it's they just want to go skiing most of the year round, they want that Texas heat, whatever it may be, you do have options there. And so as much as this guy just went across a couple of little basic things that could never fully encompass the difference between the two countries, it's just interesting to hear the mindset change, even from the state to state and province to province.